If you would, take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I want to continue uh, our sequential study of this book of 1 Corinthians. I, I've never sat through um, a series of messages on the book of 1 Corinthians, and in many ways it is, it is untouched uh, territory for Bible exposition. There are very few books uh, of expository sermons on this letter to the Corinthians, and many challenges and many things that are taught in this book that uh, really require uh, much attention and much uh, skill in handling the Word, as well as on your part in listening to the Word. And so we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 14, and the message today is entitled, Tough Love. And I really cannot think of a better title to put on this message, and I think these two words summarize verses 14 to 21, and Lord willing, we'll be able to, to cover this. The Apostle Paul writes, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ... Yet you would, have, you would not have many fathers. For in Jesus Christ I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some have become arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? In the opening chapters of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul has interwoven much teaching on the subject of spiritual leadership. And in these opening chapters, Paul has painted various pictures of what a spiritual leader looks like among the flock. It's a picture for a pastor. It's a picture for an elder. And there have been many such pictures to this point. He has spoken of a spiritual leader first as a servant, as one who is given to promoting the spiritual good of those who are in the body of Christ. He's also pictured as a farmer who is always sowing the good seed. He is always spreading the Word of God in a prolific way so that there would be much fruitfulness in the lives of the people. He's also pictured as a builder, one who has laid a foundation, which is Christ, and is called upon to build up from that foundation with gold and silver and precious stones. He is to be an instrument in the hand of God in building up the faith of the saints of God and seeing the church of Jesus Christ built up. He is also pictured as a galley slave. And we saw that at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, one whose oar is always in the water, a third-level galley slave, who is pulling his oar in a place that, where the attention is not on him, but upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other picture that Paul has given to us is that of a steward. One who works in his master's household and who has been entrusted with a stewardship. Uh, he is to be faithful uh, with his master's message. And he is to be distributing it to those within the household, always teaching and always preaching the Word, knowing that one day he will give an account to his master for how he has faithfully dispensed what was put into his hands. As we come now to these final verses in chapter 4, Paul adds yet a sixth 
image of what a spiritual leader looks like, specifically one who is used by God to lead and feed the flock of God. And this picture is that of a father. A spiritual leader is to be like a father in the family of God. Now, this is to say that he is to be used by God to bring about the new birth of many who would come into the family of God. Uh, Paul sees himself in these verses as a father. We see that in verse 14, he refers to them as beloved children. In verse 15, he says, I became your father through the gospel, and calls on them in verse 16 to imitate him as children always imitate their father or should. In verse 21, he speaks even of discipline, something that a father administers to his children. And in these verses, Paul is picturing his relationship with the Corinthians, and he sees his ministry as that of a spiritual father. And as we look at these verses today, uh, we will give thought to this very picture of spiritual leadership. Now, just a bit of background again. Paul had come to Corinth and been the founding pastor of this church. He'd been there for 18 months. And Paul was the means in the hand of God that brought about their conversions as he had preached the gospel. Uh, Paul began by nurturing them and developing them uh, in the Lord as a father would with newborn children. And they were developing and they were growing. But after 18 months in the providence of God, God led Paul on in his missionary journey. And in Paul's absence, there came other men into the church who brought their influence. And it was not the same influence that Paul had brought. Now, there was worldly wisdom that was seeping into the church, that was coming from Athens and, and being added to the doctrine that Paul had been teaching. And as always, with human wisdom, it always produces arrogance. It always produces pride. Uh, the truth is humbling and exalts God and humbles man. But human wisdom actually brings God down and elevates man. And that influence was coming about in the church at Corinth. And so Paul sends this letter and speaks to them to put the church back in its rightful place. And as he does, he refers to them as spiritual babies. He did that earlier in chapter 3, as you would recall. He said in chapter 3, verse 1, "...and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men." Uh, that means those who had reached spiritual maturity, but as to infants in Christ. And Paul says, "...even as I write to you now, I'm having to address you as spiritual infants, as little babies." In other words, they had remained in spiritual diapers. Uh, they continued to suck their spiritual thumbs. They were spiritual crybabies. They pouted. They whined. Uh, they wet themselves, spiritually speaking. And there was a time in their spiritual life when they were first converted to Christ that that was just a part of being a baby. But by this point, they should be young men and young adult women in the Lord, and to put behind them childish things. There should have been growth. There should have been development in their spiritual lives. But if anything, they have regressed and have gone back to a state of spiritual infancy. And so Paul speaks to them now and chides them and challenges them to grow up and to grow up in the things of the Lord. And in these verses, all within appropriate boundaries, Paul speaks to them with tough love. As a result of 
where they are spiritually. Paul, was, Paul must now bring corrective words to them. It is always difficult for the one who gives these words to, to come across in this manner. And it is always difficult for those who need to hear these words to receive them. But Paul does this in proper fashion, and it is for their own spiritual good. And there are times in each one of our own spiritual lives when we need tough love to come from the Word of God as well. Uh, there are times in all of our lives when we need the rebuke of the Word of God and when we need to be reproved. And there are times when we need to be chastened by Scripture to bring us back to the place where we need to be that we would put away our childishness and grow on in the grace of God. That is what Paul does in these verses. So I want to begin in verse 14, and I want us to walk through this passage together, and I want to explain it, and I trust that God will bring it home to your heart and that there will be much spiritual good for each one of us. I want you to note in verse 14 a father's correction. And this is a part of a father's relationship to his children. A father is never intended to be a buddy to his children. There, there is a friendship and, and there is a camaraderie that a father enjoys with his children, but there is also this element of correction that a father must bring to his children for their good. And that is the role that Paul is assuming with the Corinthians in verse 14. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you. Now, this word admonish means to exhort with a warning. And Paul is saying, I am warning you about where your spiritual life is and where it is headed. And the word literally, admonish, means to put into the mind with the purpose of warning and reproving. It, it presupposes that something is wrong and that there needs to be a confrontation and a correction with a strong warning that is given in order for there to be life correction experience. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you. He's referring to verses 6 through 13, which we looked at two weeks ago. And in verses 6 through 13, Paul is put in the awkward position of having to speak to them as though they are thick-headed. Uh, simple words of communication find no entrance into their hearts. And so Paul must speak with biting sarcasm. And it, Paul must address them uh, with, with irony in order to, in a sense, thump them on their thick forehead in order to get their attention. And sometimes fathers have to speak that way to their children in order to secure their attention. And in verses 6 through 13, Paul did that in words that just drip with sarcasm. Uh, I'll not go back through those verses, but your eye can, can see it is perhaps the most sarcastic, these are the most sarcastic words to ever come from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And he says, I did not write these things to shame you. Uh, the word really means, I, I, did not, I do not say this to demean you or to disgrace you unnecessarily. I didn't speak these words to, to put you down and cause you to lose face. And Paul is saying, I did not mean to be overly hard and cause you to cower or to cringe. Although Paul will, would surely say that my strong words were needed because you were not paying attention to what I have been saying to you. Instead, he says, I have spoken to admonish you. And that speaks of correction. The Corinthians needed correction. 
And you and I live in need of the correction of the Word of God as we sit under its ministry. Now, Paul reaffirms his love for them when he adds, as my beloved children. Now, the word beloved means deeply loved. Not just loved, but deeply loved. And he reminds them that these strong words that he speaks to them flow from a heart of enormous love. In fact, he is speaking the truth in love. It would only be selfishness on Paul's part that would withhold these words and not have to go through the unpleasantness of confronting them, but because he truly loves them, he wants God's best for their lives. And if they are to have God's best for their lives, they must have this tough love in order for them to turn away from this childish spiritual behavior and move on in the things of God. Notice he says, my beloved children. Uh, the, the word my indicates that Paul was a part of being used by God in their new birth for them to be brought into the family of God. And Paul will always be their spiritual father and they will always be his spiritual children. There is a, a lasting, unique bond and relationship that always exists between those who are brought to faith in Christ and the human instrument that God used to bring the gospel to them and to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul refers to them here very lovingly as my beloved children. But because they are his deeply loved sons and daughters, in the kingdom of God, this also bears responsibility on Paul's part. Now, Paul is not their doting grandfather. Uh, he is not just a slap-happy uncle, always just patting them on the back, but having no responsibility for their upbringing. No, Paul is their father in the Lord. And this requires much tough love on Paul's part, and at times the awkwardness of confrontation and admonishing them and putting into their mind a warning at times. This is necessary on the part of all who would serve in spiritual leadership. This is necessary for all of the elders of our church to at times speak with tough love. It is incumbent upon every pastor to assume at times a role of admonition and issuing warning to individuals in the flock lest they go astray in their spiritual lives. And I think the same can be said for those who lead in small group ministry and have a little flock entrusted to their care and to watch over them. And it's not just positive platitudes and pats on the back that are to always be given. But a demanding part of spiritual leadership is at times to warn, to reprove, to rebuke, and to speak words of admonition. And so for those of us who are involved in spiritual leadership in the life of this church, as well as in other ministries. This is an essential part of spiritual leadership. And it involves, at times, awkward confrontation and correction. That is what Paul is doing, all within the boundaries of the will of God and proper spiritual uh, words. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul will say to them, I was both like a mother with tender affection and love, but I was also like a father, speaking words of exhortation and admonition and entreating you. And spiritual leadership requires both voices, both the tender words as well as tough love. Well, this leads to verse 15. I want you to note, second, a father's commitment. Having called them his beloved children and 
saying, I must admonish you, which is a strong word. It's stronger in the Greek than it is in the English, which means I'm really warning you about the direction of your spiritual life. Paul now underscores the right that he has to speak to them in this way. It is not improper for Paul to use such strong words. It is because he says, I am your Father in the Lord, and I will always have the right and the responsibility to admonish you and to warn you when it is proper. So, verse 15 is all about this unique relationship that Paul has with the Corinthians. He says in verse 15, For if you were to have countless tutors in the Lord... Stop right there. Paul is speaking with hyperbole here. And he is acknowledging that there are many other men in their lives who are spiritual leaders, and it is implied here that they are anything but spiritual fathers to them. He says, if you were to have countless tutors in the Lord, now the word countless literally means thousands. If you were to have thousands of tutors in Christ, in other words, those teaching you in Christ, uh, tutors is a word that is drawn from the ancient Greek culture. When we think of a tutor, we, we think of, would you meet me uh, at school at 4.30 after school is over and let me go through your homework. But the word tutor here, as we're intended to understand it, refers to a, a guardian. Someone who, is, who works for someone in the upper class who can afford to have many people in his home serving him with servants and a steward, and there would be a tutor. And a tutor was one who was entrusted by the father with the oversight of his children. And we studied this in Galatians 3 and verse 24 in our study of the book of Galatians. And the tutor was to walk the child to school. And he was to oversee his education. He was to make certain that the child was paying attention in his studies and to make certain that the homework was, was being done. This tutor uh, was usually harsh and strict and stern and at times would use berating tactics and shaming tactics in order to try to intimidate the child into their studies. And Paul is saying, you have had countless tutors in Christ. Many have come along after I have left. And Paul is implying none of them have loved you like I have loved you. And none of them has been as patient and long-suffering with you as I have. And they have been stern and harsh, but you know that it is true that I have been loving and long-suffering towards you, and I have given myself to you. These tutors are those who are bringing the influence of worldly wisdom into the church at Corinth, who are augmenting the message of the Christian faith with worldly ideas and secular thinking and humanistic thought and, and merging that with the truth of the gospel so as to dilute the purity of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. In reality, these tutors were nothing more than babysitters. And this implies that the Corinthians are still babies. And they are still in need of someone to walk them to school and someone to be always looking over their shoulder and to make certain that you're paying attention in class and to make certain that you are learning the truth that has been entrusted to you. And what is implied here is that the, Christian, that the Corinthians were not self-initiating, they were not self-motivating, and they were not giving themselves to the Christian faith as they should. And Paul is acknowledging this here. And he says, you have had thousands of tutors in Christ, and they have all had their influence on you. Yet you would not have many fathers. 
And by that, Paul is saying that in reality, you only have one Father in the Lord, and that is the role that He has placed in their life, played in their life. Apollos would come along, and, and others in the faith who would also serve as supportive spiritual leaders at later times. But Paul is clinging to this ongoing relationship that he has with the Corinthians and saying, I have the right to speak straight to you and to tell you the truth about your spiritual life. He says, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. What a precious relationship it is for anyone who preaches the gospel, for there to be those who have been one to Christ and always to feel a sense of connectedness and, and a bond with that one who has come to the Lord. And that is what Paul is saying here. Through Paul, they came to faith in the gospel. Paul planted the seed of the gospel, and the Spirit of God caused it to germinate, and they were saved. Paul was there for 18 months, and he had labored to preach the gospel in Corinth, which brought about their new birth. Now, to be sure, Paul was not the source of their new birth. He was only the human instrument in the hand of God through whom God worked, but God always works through human means. God always works through human instruments who bring the gospel and teach and preach the gospel to others. And that is what Paul is saying here. And the means of their birth into Christ, it's very clear at the end of verse 15, it was through the gospel. Now, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The source of every new birth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. No one is ever saved by any other message, by any other means than the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we feel so compelled to be involved in the work of missions, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, because there are not other ways of salvation for other people in other places. We are indebted to every man to share of the riches of Christ that have been entrusted to us. And so Paul acknowledges this, and he says, I became your father through the gospel. All this is to say, Paul had this special relationship with them in the Lord, and he has the right. He has the responsibility to be outspoken with them and to address them as he does now for their own spiritual good. So I want you to note third, a father's counsel. In verse 16, Paul now gives the counsel to them. What should they do? As they have had brought to their attention their own spiritual immaturity. And they have been told that they are lacking in their own spiritual development. What should they do? Paul gives a very interesting antidote. He gives his counsel. And in verse 16, Paul says, Therefore, I exhort you. This word exhort is a very strong word. It means to come alongside of someone and to draw up very close to them. Now, Paul is away in Ephesus, and he is ministering there, and Corinth is many miles away. Now, this has nothing to do with geographical proximity. It has to do with spiritual proximity and his heart toward their heart. And he said, I exhort you. I passionately plead with you. Paul is not just setting it out before them, but he is urging them and seeking to persuade them to pursue a course of action. This is what a father does. A father's love is so strong 
that he even pleads with his own children to pursue the appropriate course of action for their own good and for the glory of God. And so Paul says, therefore, I exhort you, notice what he says, be imitators of me. Now, at first reading, someone might say, what an arrogant thing for Paul to say, that this is the correction for where they are spiritually. You need to be like me. Well, think about this. If Paul said anything else, he'd be a hypocrite. Of course, he's inviting them to follow him as he follows the Lord. Later in this very book, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, this is the key verse that unlocks this verse. When Paul says, be imitators of me, there is a qualifier to his spiritual leadership that he will underscore later in this book. But we need to understand this right now. And so in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul says, here it is again, be imitators of me. Now this word imitator means to be a mimic. And we understand what a what a mimic is. Sometimes we see on television someone who's, who does impressions of, of other famous people, and they, they mimic their accent and their facial contortions, and, and they look and sound just like someone else. That's what Paul is saying here. You need to mimic me, and you need to sound like me, and you need to walk like me, you need to talk like me, you need to conduct yourself like me. Now, he goes on to add this important qualifier. Just as I also am of Christ. He is saying, follow me as I follow Christ. He is saying, follow me to the extent that I follow Christ certainly in ways that Paul would not be following Christ, they were not to emulate. But in every way that Paul is emulating Christ, it is incumbent upon those who are under the influence of that spiritual leader to imitate their life and to imitate their ministry. And that is what Paul is saying here. And To be sure, this is in the imperative mood, meaning this is a command. Paul is issuing an apostolic command, and it's in the present tense, which is to say, keep on always becoming an imitator of me. We all need spiritual leaders in our lives. Those who are mature in the Lord those who have grown beyond where I am spiritually, who are out on the point, who are out ahead of the flock, and who are following in close footstep behind the Lord Jesus Christ, and who become an incarnation of Christ before the flock, and who by the very example of their lives become a positive influence to pull others along in their spiritual lives. Paul says the same in Philippians 3 and in verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example. And this really is what discipleship is all about, is it not? Uh, Levitic, uh, excuse me, Luke 6 verse 40, Jesus said a disciple after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. There is to be one life rubbing against another life. And there is to be one life exemplifying before many lives how they should live and how they should conduct themselves. Certainly, no leader is perfect, and no leader is fully mature. Every spiritual leader is in process of being developed within their own walk with the Lord. But there should be such a reality of Jesus Christ in their lives, by their attitudes, by their actions, by their countenance, by their words, by their priorities, by their families, that they would have a positive pull on the flock 
to influence them and to pull them in the right direction. John MacArthur says spiritual leadership boiled down to one word is the word influence. It's not a title. It's not a job. It's not a name on a door. It is all about the power of God in a person's life to cast an influence that pulls them in a certain direction by the way they carry themselves. And again, it presupposes that this leader is following Christ. So that is why Paul, in verse 16, says, this is the solution for your spiritual life at this point. And this is, this is somewhat breathtaking. Here's what you need to do to stop being a spiritual infant. You need to become an imitator of me. Now, with the Corinthians, I need to say that they were becoming like these other tutors. They were becoming like these other teachers. These other teachers who brought the wisdom of the world and superiority of speech and rhetorical and oratorical skills and these new leaders who brought the influence of worldly thinking, this was rubbing off on the Corinthians. And it was making them brash and arrogant and prideful and self-sufficient and self-centered and, and self-reliant. It was making them cocky. And they had lost a sense of their true humility. Paul will later say in this very uh, epistle, I am what I am by the grace of God. The Corinthians had totally lost sight of the grace of God. And they were latched on to worldly wisdom, and it was causing them to have a self-elevated view. And so when Paul says, be imitators of me, he is in reality saying, you whom I deeply love, you, my beloved children, you need to follow my example of lowliness of heart and self-denial and self-sacrifice rather than imitating these other men who, quite frankly, are very arrogant and I see their effects in the way that you are conducting yourself. So, in verse 17, under this same thought of a father's counsel, and, and, and those are very strong words for Paul to give to the Corinthians. He says, for this reason, in verse 17, and we would ask for what reason? The, re the reason refers back to the Corinthians being imitators of Paul and walking in humility and walking in self-denial. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy. Paul is unable to leave what he is doing in Ephesus. Uh, he will tell us elsewhere that he must remain in Ephesus until the day of Pentecost. And so Paul has so many balls in the air, he cannot drop everything else that he is doing and come immediately to this pressing situation with the Corinthians. Paul cannot be everywhere present at one time. And so Paul must continue in Ephesus. So until Paul can come and deal with this in his own way, face to face, he sends Timothy. Timothy is an emissary of Paul. Now, notice how he describes Timothy. Timothy will go in his stead. Timothy will represent Paul with the Corinthians. Now, notice how he describes Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He says this to endear Timothy to the Corinthians. They, too, are... Uh, Timothy is also a spiritual child of mine, even as the Corinthians are beloved children, uniquely to Paul. And this tells us that 
Paul was the instrument in the hand of God that brought about Timothy's conversion. I believe that that took place in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 21. As Paul's first missionary journey took him through Galatia, and Timothy's mother and grandmother had planted the Scripture in Timothy's heart, and as Paul came through and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and at that point Paul had John Mark with him, I believe that Timothy was brought into a saving relationship with Christ. And later, on this second missionary journey, Paul would pick up Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, and Timothy would accompany him for much of this second missionary journey. But here's the point. Just as the Corinthians look to Paul, or should be looking to Paul, as their spiritual father, so Timothy has the same relationship to Paul. Timothy is also a beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And by the way, nothing uh, more highly can be said of a child in the Lord than this word faithful. That Timothy is a faithful child in the Lord. And so Paul says, I am sending to you someone just like you. I am sending to you, my beloved children, another beloved child who will minister on my behalf until I can come. And he goes on to say here, and he will remind you, Timothy will remind you, Corinthians, now note, of my ways which are in Christ. This clearly states that Paul's ways are in Christ. When he says, my ways, he's referring to the manner of his life and the message of his teaching. Ways are plural, and it's intended to represent the entirety of Paul's life and Paul's ministry, which he says are in Christ. He is saying, Timothy will come, and as I have told you to be an imitator of me, Timothy will bring explanation to that, and he will bring details to this, and he will remind you what you already know of what it looks like to walk as a humble servant of the Lord and to be bound by the truth of the Word of God. When Paul says, he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, that is another way of saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. That little prepositional phrase, in Christ, is the whole key. It's not just follow me. It is in reality, follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. It says something about the human nature. It says something about every one of us, that we all need examples we all need people who are in front of us, who are walking the walk and who are talking the talk, and for our lives to be under their influence and sway and to be inspired and to be motivated and to be challenged, that we would move out in the things of God. Again, that there would be an incarnation in someone's life of the reality of Jesus Christ before others. And so Paul says, I can't come right now, but I'm sending Timothy to you, who is also a beloved child, and Timothy will remind you of my ways in Christ. And then he adds this at the end of the verse, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And Paul had lived a very consistent life, and he had preached a very consistent message and Paul didn't have one message for one church and, and then something contradictory for another church. Paul was not speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He is saying, I am sending Timothy to remind you of my ways, and it's what I've taught in every church, wherever I've gone, in every pulpit I've stood, and as I've lived my life before different flocks, there has been this consistency. Consistency. 
And so in these two verses, verses 16 and 17, in reality, Paul is calling for, from the Corinthians, Christ-likeness as modeled by Paul. He is calling for humility and lowliness of mind that is totally contrary to the influences of these other tutors who were bringing to you the message of the world. How positive it is in every one of our spiritual lives for us to have spiritual leaders to model the message and to point us in the right direction. And for those of us who are spiritual leaders in this flock, what a humbling challenge this is that others would be coming in behind us and following our example. And there would be a reproduction of our priorities and our passions. And that is why it is incumbent upon us that each and every pastor and elder and teacher and small group leader in our church be doggedly and determinately by grace following the Lord Jesus Christ and pulling others in behind us. Now, I want you to note in verse 18, fourth, a father's confrontation. There are times when fathers must address sin issues in their children. And that is what Paul is doing here with the Corinthians under this same metaphor. And so Paul actually now becomes more, more specific. He puts his finger on the live nerve. He now announces the sin. This is the besetting sin in the life at Corinth. He says, now some, and that word some is an important word. It's not representative of all. Uh, there is an inner circle. Now some have become arrogant. And it is the arrogance of the sum that is spreading to the rest. Paul will say in the very next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? And arrogance in one part of the body will spread quietly, beneath the surface like leaven in bread or among the, in the flour, and it will have its spreading influence in the rest of the body. When he says, now, have some, now some have become arrogant. We saw this word arrogant earlier in chapter 4, verse 6. This is not the first time that the word arrogance has been assigned to the Corinthians. And nothing worse could be said than that one is arrogant. God is opposed to the proud, and He gives grace to the humble. This word arrogant means to be inflated, to be puffed up, to be blown up. And the idea is to have an inflated sense of one's own importance, to have an inflated sense of one's own ability, to have an inflated sense of one's own life. This word arrogant means also to become prideful, to become full of one's self, to be self-exalting, to be self-righteous. And it is these some who have become arrogant that are based primarily among these tutors are unfortunately spreading their arrogance to those who are under their influence. Uh, a pupil, after he's been fully trained, will be exactly like his teacher, and that is true for better or for worse. Not only for good, but also for bad. And that is what is happening in Corinth. And so Paul confronts this. Paul actually says, now some have become arrogant, and then he adds, as though I were not coming to you. You see, these tutors were saying, 
Well, if Paul really loved you, he would be here. But he's not here, so he must not love you. You need to listen to us. You need to come under our influence because Paul's not here right now. And if Paul really loved you, he would be here. And they are almost challenging Paul to come back. And Paul has caught word of this. And Paul says, some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. And so he is forced to say this in verse 19. But I will come to you. And he adds the words of a very humble man. If the Lord wills. It shows something of the lowliness and the humility and the dependence of the Apostle Paul under the sovereignty of God. And Paul is very aware that God is seated in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. And Paul is a bondservant who has yielded his life under the supreme authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and he realizes every circumstance, every success, every failure, every challenge, every trial, everything in my life and ministry is under the purview of the sovereignty of God. This little condition, if the Lord wills, is like pulling back the veil just a little bit and allowing us to see into the heart of the Apostle Paul and see that he is a man who has clothed himself with lowliness and humility. He understands that Christ is the head of the church, and that he is but a galley slave and a steward and a servant who is dispensing the Lord's message, but it is incumbent upon him as a spiritual father to assert him at times, in the lives of these children. But I will come to you if the Lord wills. And now these words. And I will find out not just the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. Paul is saying, when I show up, we will really find out who's just a bag of hot air. And who is wielding their influence among God's children in a carnal fashion. And it will be those who have true spiritual power in their lives. The truth of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and that will be demonstrated to be the true spiritual leader. It's not according to rhetorical skills. It's not according to oratorical abilities to sway and to manipulate others. But it will be by the power of God in the truth and in the Spirit of God in their lives that will be the mark. And Paul affirms that in verse 20. Note how verse 20 begins. It begins with the word for, which introduces an explanation. And Paul is explaining what he just said. In other words... He is saying, let me give you more insight into what I am saying. The difference between mere, empty, religious-sounding jargon and the reality of the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 20, for the kingdom of God. Now stop right there. When he says for the kingdom of God, he is referring to the present reign and reality of God in the lives of all true spiritual children. The kingdom of God. In other words, the reality of the presence of the power, of the reign of God in a person's life does not consist in words. When he says words here, he is referring to humanistic words. He is referring to empty rhetoric and empty superiority of speech. He is referring to manipulative words that are not in demonstration of God's truth and in God's power. Obviously, the truth does come in words. And so he is not denying that the words of truth are not to be spoken in the church. He is saying that the words of man-centered truth 
secular worldliness, humanistic philosophy. The kingdom of God does not consist in these things. And I want to say again, the implication is that is what these tutors are spreading in Corinth. Paul says, but in power. The power is in the truth, the power is in the Holy Spirit, and the power is in the example of a godly, humble life that is marked by self-denial and self-sacrifice, lowering themselves before the sovereignty and the lordship of Jesus Christ and bowing beneath the banner of truth, therein lies the power. And Paul is saying, you should be able to recognize who a true spiritual leader is in your midst. It is not these thousands of tutors who are stern and strict and intimidating with you. It is those who are imitating Christ and have the power of God in their lives. These words are very clear, and these words are very important regarding the marks of true spiritual leadership. And now finally, verse 21, and we're quickly dismissed, a father's chastisement. So Paul now extends the father-child metaphor one step further, and he brings this to really a bottom line with the Corinthians. And he begins verse 21, he says, what do you desire? In other words, he is saying, how do you want this? And he's giving them a choice. And this choice can work out in one of two ways. How do you want this to end up? Which way will it be, Corinthians? You decide. And Paul stands as the fork in the road here. And they must decide which path they will take and which way they will go in their spiritual lives. Who will you follow? And what will you follow? Will you follow the countless tutors... Or will you follow and imitate the example of your spiritual father? So he says, what do you desire? Verse 21, shall I come to you with a rod? Now Paul is speaking figuratively here. He's speaking metaphorically. He's not coming with a literal rod in his hand to physically inflict pain to the Corinthians. No, it's far more painful. He will be coming with the power of God in his words, in his leadership, in his influence, and in his life. And rod represents here the instrument of discipline. It is a severe and pain-inflicting instrument of discipline. We're all aware in the book of Proverbs, the different Proverbs that say, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. A rod, is intent, a rod is not a little slap on the back of the hand. A rod is intended to administer severe pain and a whelp that in, by which the pain is so strong that it breaks the child from the wrong course of action. The pain inflicted is so penetrating and so deep and so stinging that it, it, it will break the child from the wrong course of action. And so Paul says, what do you desire? How do you want this to work out when I come? Shall I come to you with a rod? And what is implied here is that Paul will speak openly and publicly before the whole church. And if necessary, he will carry out church discipline. And the whole next chapter is about one such man who needs to be already put out of the church and because he's having an incestuous, immoral relationship within his own family that is unlawful and improper. And when he says, shall I come to you with a rod, he is saying, if I need to use the stick to whip you into shape, I will do so for your own good. And then he says, or, 
as if to say, which way will it be? You decide. Or with love and a spirit of gentleness. Paul has already made known his preference in the matter. Like any father, no father wants to choose the path of using the rod. No father desires to hear the cry of his child, if that can be avoided. But if it becomes necessary, it will be used for the greater good of rerouting the child's life and putting it onto the proper path. And so Paul is in essence praying, please make the right choice, you Corinthians. Please repent. Please humble yourself. Please stop your arrogance. Please stop your strutting. Please stop your pontificating. Humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you at the proper time. Clothe yourselves with humility and lowliness of mind. This is like what Jesus calls for in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek. This is precisely what Paul is calling for from the lives of the Corinthians. And this is what God is always calling for in our own lives, is it not? Every step of Christian growth and maturity is a step downward into grace. We must be always humbling ourselves and lowering ourselves under the authority of the sovereignty of God. And we must be aligning ourselves with spiritual leaders who are walking in purity and in godliness. And no spiritual leader is glorified. No spiritual leader has reached perfection. And yet there needs to be evidences in their lives of maturity and the fruit of the Spirit and godliness. And we all need, as we humble ourselves, to be under the influence and the sway of spiritual men who minister the Word of God and who walk in purity and in godliness. May every one of us here today, myself included, may we all humble ourselves before the Lord. May we all say, I am what I am by the grace of God. May we all understand that the only thing good about me is what God is doing in my life that we are all debtors of grace. Not every church was a Corinthian church. This church had become the most arrogant, had become the most prideful, and what is sad, they were the most gifted. They had the most potential. They had the most entrusted to them by God at this time. They were placed in such a strategic position there in Corinth in Asia Minor, and yet they, they squandered their opportunity. They, they blew it, and it did, not, it did not become better. Paul will have to write a second letter to the Corinthians, and it shows just how carnal a Christian can be. They stand forever as an example to every one of us how worldly and how carnal someone can actually be and still be regenerate and still have the Spirit of God within them. Let us pull away from all that we see in them. And in many ways, it's like looking into a mirror, and at times we see ourselves, our own stubbornness, and our own self-reliance, and our own self-centeredness. May we turn away from what we see in the Corinthians. May we be imitators of Christ who humbled himself, became a bondservant, and humbled himself unto death, even death on a cross. And may we take up our cross. May we be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I bring this message to conclusion, may God the Holy Spirit be actively involved right now in this service and in your heart and in your mind. May the Lord be connecting these truths to your life. May you absorb them.
may you possess these words and may you be as I would be like the Corinthians, those who would desire to, to turn away, or what Paul requires of the Corinthians, to turn away from such arrogance and such boasting and such pride. The greatest church is the most humble church, the church that realizes its dependence and its necessity upon God's grace. May all of us stand in amazement that the Lord has even chosen to save me. May we all stand in amazement that the Lord would invest so much in my life. May we stand in amazement that the Lord would allow us to be in a church like this where there are true evidences of holiness and godliness and purity and where there are godly leaders and godly men who walk in humility and set an example before the flock. May the Lord deepen our humility as we lead before you. Let us pray. And as I pray, we will not sing a closing hymn, but we'll take the offering after after I pray. I would like for the instruments to play, though, during the offering. Father, we've looked at your word, and admittedly, these verses do speak of tough talk, a tough love, and they're challenging, and they're difficult to even for me to bring. They bring conviction to my own heart that I need to be more of an example to this flock. I pray by your grace you would make me more and more into the man you would have me to be. I pray for my fellow elders in this church. I thank you for each of these men. I thank you for their humility. I thank you for their dependency. And I pray that you would cultivate that yet more in their lives. And I pray for our flock. I pray for each one of us here today that we would learn from this negative example of the Corinthians. Admittedly, these verses are somewhat complicated and require much background and connecting of passages and thoughts and only your Holy Spirit can really bring it home with understanding and bring it home to life within us. But spare us from ever becoming a Corinthian church. May we move forward on our knees. May we be clothed with repentance and confession of sin and lowliness of mind. May we yield to one another. May we consider the interests of others as more important than our own. May we not be swayed by slick-talking speakers who would bring superiority of speech and empty rhetoric that would flatter us and manipulate us and stroke our ego and inflate pride. Instead, may we die daily to self. May we be those who are always denying ourselves, taking up a cross, and following after Christ. God, would you mature us and develop us? Would you not leave us in a state of spiritual infancy? Would you not allow us to regress and to go backwards? Would you nurture us and develop us, take us on to spiritual adulthood. May we mature and grow even more than that. May we be marked by authentic Christ-likeness. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.